Hey everyone, welcome to uh, welcome to our fire, fireside chat. Today we'll be talking about open source and uh, cloud technologies, and particularly how these uh, technologies can help retailers and e-commerce stay competitive and move past these challenging times, among other topics, of course. So I'm very excited to introduce uh, introduce to Jan Hegewald, Director of Engineering at Zalando. Uh, and Alex Timlin, Senior Vice President at Marsis, an uh, SAP company. I'm Andrea Mandial, I'm the Head of Field Marketing at Avon, and I'll be your host today. And I think it's time for us to start. I have prepared seven questions, which are pretty wide, so I really hope at the end of the session we'll have some time for Q&A. You can write me directly or in the chat, whatever is easier for you. Uh, but I think we're ready to, to start now. So if we look at recent development, I believe what has changed wasn't just the, the financial outlook of the retailers, but also how they plan long term. Yeah, so we looked at we've seen how retailers behave a little bit more like e-commerce companies, right? Because they offer these things like click and collect, uh, grocery delivery uh, services and so on. There's things that um, probably will stay for the long term and others that will go away. So. I'm asking, let's start with uh, with you, uh, Alex. Like, what do you think it's going to, to stay for a while? Uh, and what are the things that we're not going to see in the future? And you don't need to refer only to the things I just mentioned, but we can also talk about chatbots or uh, um, smart speaker shopping or whatever comes to your, to your mind when you're thinking of e-commerce or retail trends. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they talk about retail trends, kind of concentrate on what's going on in Berlin, Munich, Madrid, Barcelona, the kind of the main centers. But I think it's what's happening in the regions is, is actually a little bit more important. And I think the biggest thing about what's happened over the last kind of 12 to 24 months is a whole new generation of people engaging with brands in a very, very different way, particularly through mobile devices. So last year, there was 62% uh, of the journeys in the US in out of town locations. So those outside of the big urban centers started and ended with a mobile app. Not a mobile device, but a mobile app. So how people are shopping, how people are interacting, and how people are using has changed a lot in terms of their access because of stores being closed. And I think those trends won't go away. People using Zoom, people using video, people engaging with brands digitally has fundamentally changed. Will it be exactly the same as uh, this time this time next year? Probably not, but I think that trend is definitely going to continue. And I think the the the, the over reliance on uh, digital as a separate property is is probably going to be the one that will definitely disappear. So I think people looking at their e-commerce, their app, their digital marketing strategy as something outside of their core retail operations. I see that going away as people start to think a little bit more holistically about. Where, where is my data being generated? How is it being generated? And how do I leverage that to look at new business opportunities, new business models and disruptive ways of, of growing our businesses? People like Zalando have done so well. That's that's very interesting. Like if we if we're looking more from the tech perspective, is there anything that you can see uh, changing, uh, Jan? I mean, Zalando is more e-commerce and retail, but what is your take in it? Um. I wouldn't say that this is starting with the tech. I think it as always starts with the business. And um, yeah, I can I can uh, fully support with what Alex said. Um, I think a trend that we also see is that online and offline, uh, so in a way like tech and, and the traditional business are coming closer together. For example, at Zalando, uh, we have what we call connected retail stores. So this is kind of traditional um, fashion stores connected to our platform which was super helpful, of course, during the pandemic um, and during the lockdowns. But this will also continue, uh, also similar to Alex's uh, uh, explanation. And we also see other use cases of these two coming together. So you can imagine things like what we also do today, like faster delivery and faster fulfillment from local stores, which have the assortment. And yet you as a customer might be interested in or these click and collect use cases. And I, I think this is something that is enabled through technology, but, but also serves the business purpose. Um, if we go back to the, to the business use cases also, I think that uh, a big, big topic that is coming based on the awareness of, uh, of customers is the sustainability. So uh, customers are much more, much more mindful about, for example, used materials, like being at organic cotton, cotton but also production processes like uh, less water, water consumption and ethical work conditions and um, this is a topic that is becoming more and more uh, interesting of course there are also technological 
uh, especially also buzzwords like you can uh, certify the um, supply chain to, on a blockchain. Uh, but it's it's a question whether this is really needed. But this topic is staying for sure and is growing. We also see this in the in the context of circular fashion. Like on on Zalando, you can also buy and sell pre-owned items um, that you are inspired by or that you have bought and um, are still in good condition, but you don't use them anymore. So that's for sure also here to uh, here to stay. And um, maybe more on the technical side is what I would see in, in the inspiration and advice. Uh, area of online shopping, um, being at the traditional personalization that we're talking about for years now, um, but also like curated uh, in, in fashion context, curated outfits, uh, so that you do not only buy one item, but normally as a customer, you're interested in getting your uh, perfect, uh, complete um, uh, outfit for, for a special occasion. And that can be manually curated through inferences supported through technology or it can be automatically uh, curated through artificial intelligence. And, and uh, I think we're getting now to a place where there's much more possible in that area and uh, where people also expect it. And that also brings me to the last trend that I see that is also here to stay. And that is an expectation from customers uh, towards convenience. Um, I mean, I talked about it when, when online and offline comes together and can also benefit mutually from shorter delivery times from local stores to the customers, but also um, in general, the expectations rise uh, because customers expect to get the, the items they buy delivered to their homes faster and faster and have a seamless experience around that. And of course, there's also a lot that technology can do there, especially also to, to take care of sustainable solutions. Um, and this for sure will also not go away, but this will continue to increase, I would say. Yeah. I think that's one thing I'd really pick up on and, and, and re-emphasize as well. I think the, the artificial intelligence has got a bit of a bad reputation in terms of being a bit of a buzzword. But I think when we're looking at the, the adoption of different types of AI technology to actually enhance that personalized experience and look at doing the hard work for the customer, I think that's the technology trend that's definitely going to continue, which is looking at how do you provide less friction, the customer experience and greater operational efficiency as a business. That's about not just where your data lives, but how you put your data to work. And I think that's why we're seeing a, a rise in adoption of, of cloud technologies is not just for how they're storing data, but it's about how they're utilizing data and how they're working with data is, is something that's changing. And I think that trend's definitely going to continue. And then, uh, and will definitely serve businesses and customers better ultimately as it as it becomes more adopted. I think um, what uh, I'm going to go for what Jan said la, the, la, the last thing he said uh, the customer expectations being something like you know on the rising uh, is this also something that you can call like a challenge because that's the that that was the the next thing I was going to ask you like what are the challenges like now we know more or less what amazing things that are in store for retail and e-commerce but uh, I'm sure that there are some ch challenges that uh, they'll have to, they are facing at the moment. So um, Jan, maybe you want to start? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a fair point. I wouldn't say this is a challenge that uh, retailers are going through at the moment. I think this has been happening all the time and this will continue to happen. So, so it's definitely a challenge. And uh, I mean, it's also helping us to raise the bar for what we can do to serve our customers, right? So in that sense, it's also an opportunity. Um, if you ask for other challenges that we're currently going through at the moment, I think, of course, this is very different for offline and online retailers, I think, in the face of the pandemic. Um, uh, being part of an online retailer, I think uh, one of the challenges is that we need to take care of all our, our colleagues, while, while others are very unfortunate um, to be to have been closed due to lockdowns. Um, um, of course, the business is going on um, in, in our back ends, and our, we work hard to make sure that the workers in our warehouses are safe. Um, and another aspect for for the people that are not working in the warehouses, but the, uh, let's say white collar workers. Um, everyone that works remote um, enjoyed it very much in the beginning, but also now it turns out that there are challenges around that, like the ability to work in a focused way from home and so on. And as this is happening since quite some time, we also need to be very careful about that. Um, so this is on a very personal level. In general, I think uncertainty for retailers in general is also, I think, still in demand. In the beginning of the pandemic, um, the demand went down 
drastically. Um, so for us, afterwards, it went up again. And now it's unclear what will happen when all the lockdowns end. So there's a lot of risk in inventory, but also technical risks if you look into like things like scalability of systems due to uh, user traffic behavior or things like that. And um, I mean, it, it's kind of also daily business, but on the other hand, other hand it's, it's some of the predominant uh, strong challenges that we're currently facing, I would say. Alex, would you uh, have anything else to add? Maybe focus more on uh, actual retailers and not e-commerce? Yeah, I think the, the, the reality is, is the vast majority of the retail still happens in physical stores. So I think Jan's point around as a community, uh, should we be excited about the rise in e-commerce? 100%. It's a, it's a great thing. But uh, speaking to clients like Media Saturn or NK, uh, NKD in, in Germany or Sports Direct and the, the larger Fraser's group in the UK, they make up 95% of their revenue plus in physical stores. And when you turn off that pipeline, there literally isn't enough e-commerce capacity for them to even fulfill those orders. It's you can't flip your business model around as quickly as the disruption that happened. And I think Retailers are, are playing catch up to a huge disruption in how their humans operate, how their customers operate, how their businesses operate, and how their technology landscape needs to cater to the fact of having a distributed workforce. I think there are a huge number of pressures that are happening to businesses right now, all at the same time, coupled with reduced demand and less capital on hand. So I think if you're a retailer, it's a tough spot to try and figure out what are the right kind of changes to make in your business. and and what are the right things you can do with a shorter horizon line? I think the biggest challenge right now is people know all of their opportunities, but not many of those can be delivered the next three or six months. Like not, not many people are investing in a five-year transformation project now. They're looking at what are the incremental changes I can do in my business to better serve customers, operate more efficiently, and make sure that I have better access to uh, information and better access to decision-making quicker. And I think that's a, a challenge that's probably going to serve people better. We are hearing clients saying, we now don't plan in 16 or 20 week cycles. We plan weekly and we have daily standups. We're more agile in our decision making. Does mean it's a little bit more short termist. Uh, hopefully that changes a little bit more. But I think the, the agility and speed of change has been the biggest challenge, but has had some, uh, some benefits for people. And ultimately, I hope will benefit customers as well as we go forward. But it's a, it's still a tough time. Things are opening. They have not returned to any kind of new normal. So I think we just need to, to be aware of uh, e-commerce is great. Retail's tough. And we need to support as a community, whether you're online or offline, we're all in retail. I think it's just about making sure that we, uh, we, we look at being pragmatic and realistic about what these challenges are and, and how we uh, help the, the community move through it. Um, talking about challenges, uh, is, uh, is it possible that uh, perhaps cloud and open source technologies can do something to, to help retailers and e-commerce alike um, go through these uh, uh, times a bit more, I mean, in an easier way and be prepared for the future? Um, do you think that's a, that's a possibility? Uh, maybe Jan, would you like to start this question? Yeah, sure, I can do. Um, yeah, can these two technologies help? Uh, for sure, they always do, <laughs> to start with the easy answer, uh, but it also goes step by step. So one thing that I think is very helpful is that, that when we start with cloud, cloud enables easy scalability, right? While in a on-premise setting, you always have to care about um, how can you scale your services, like, like Alex described, right? If you have to try to at least move part of your 95% offline business to online, this is already a huge risk if you're running 5% of your business so far online. And uh, I remember also uh, from my past experience when uh, a company that I worked with uh, operated their data center, uh, of course, with a service provider, but uh, every time we wanted to extend it, something didn't, didn't, go, it didn't go well because either there was lacking power supply or there was lacking um, rec space for servers or there was uh, lacking ventilation and it, it was kind of bizarre. And, and this is just talking about the hardware, not about software and so on. And um, from the cloud, you are much more able to easily scale the business to your needs. And it also enables the flexibility, of course, in terms of the operations costs, right? Um, because essentially what cloud did is it made fixed costs become variable costs. Um, so you, you are able to do much more. And also it enables not only the, the 
let's say, normal growth, but it also enables new use cases. If we look into software engineering, uh, you can now spin up large load test environments that are kind of similar to your production environment if you want to easily, which was not imaginable in, in the times of on-premise installations. Um, and lastly, when we look at cloud, I think what is also very beneficial, uh, the recent development is that it is not like just moving the stuff that you had into something that you don't have to uh, run yourself, but it offers a lot of value added services, right? So you can have managed data stores, managed messaging services, um, out of the box machine learning capabilities that increase your productivity because these are kind of off the shelf, uh, without a shelf, uh, software components uh, that can help you uh, realize and implement more use cases. So this I would see as the biggest advantages of the cloud. Um, similarly, uh, I think open source also enhances your productivity uh, or the productivity of your engineers when building digital products because you are offered battle tested and ready to use technologies, which makes it much easier to adapt and, and the barriers uh, to enter the market or the technology um, have been lowered significantly. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, also open source software offers the opportunity to extend de facto standard software components by functionality that you see as important without having to start from scratch. So I think there's a lot of uh, benefits that you can gain from these two types of technologies. Um, this is uh, more or less the essence of the fireside chat. So I don't mind spending a little bit time, a little bit more time on this question than on the others. Um, Alex, uh, is there anything that uh, you would add to this particular point? I think that it, it's more reiterating two key points. I think that the first one about scale is fundamentally important. I think uh, there's a there's a client we have in the UK called AL.com which is appliances online. They sell electrical white goods, quite large consumer goods, uh, online only in the UK and in, in Germany and elsewhere. Uh, the managing director said, look, we saw five years worth of growth in five weeks. Like if they were managing their own infrastructure, not just for taking the orders, but for filling the orders and making sure that they're, they're managing that stock, that inventory, that supply chain. If that was a fixed project for that team, that business would not have scaled as quickly. Like you cannot project what's going to happen. And if you do see some kind of new opportunities, whether it's in new communication channels, so we saw customers uh, who closed their physical stores like Charlotte Tilbury move towards offering kind of virtual beauty consultants and virtual styling sessions. If you're using your own technology stack and you're relying on your own product team and your own development team, not just from an infrastructure perspective, but from an innovation perspective to build your own, it's very, very difficult to compete in the modern landscape particularly when it comes to new innovations. And I think, as Jan said, being able to take advantage of what's already there from other people is something that we passionately advocated in Masters. It's around how do I crowdsource what works well for the industry and then make it my own to make sure that it's specific for my business. So it's like you look at industry specific best practices and your product teams and your engineering teams make them fit for purpose and unique for your brand. But you shouldn't build everything from scratch and expect to be able to capitalize on this growth, particularly at the speed of which our customers are innovating. So I think uh, the biggest benefit of cloud technologies is about that extensibility, but more important, that flexibility of not relying on what's shipped by. I think the, the factory standard is a good analogy. It's where we're, we're not talking talking about kind of cars and components, we're talking about software. And I think what you get factory standard is not fit for purpose 24 months later. And it's recognizing that the digital world's changing way, way quickly than, uh, than any one software provider can actually forecast, myself included. Uh, so we're constantly releasing new technologies and building new technologies with our open source and cloud partners to make sure that we're, we're not just scaling up and offering more capacity but innovating and offering new opportunity as well just to make sure that we're keeping up with these changes in the market and changes in consumer behaviors yeah now that we agreed uh, that uh, cloud and open source technologies are so to say uh, fundamental tools for retailers and e-commerce maybe it's a good time to actually talk about the prerequisites for successfully adopting them um, and uh, I'll start again with uh, Jan, just because it's past. Uh, it's been a few minutes since I heard him talk. So, what do you think, Jan? What are the most important things to keep in mind when you get started? Thanks for already missing my voice. Um, yeah, I think before uh, adopting cloud technologies, what is important is 
your architecture somehow needs to be ready for it, right? So if you're running the monolith um, application that you are having problems scaling in your own data center, you will, it's also hard to scale that monolith in the cloud. So ideally you move to a microservice based architecture because then you can leverage the scalability advantages much more easily than uh, if, if you remain in a monolith uh, architecture. Um, secondly, you also need to have the cloud development and operations knowledge. And it's a somewhat different world, of course, from, from doing that uh, on, on premise. So it's definitely a different type of skill set that you need to have in order to stay on top and also to take care of safety aspects uh, and data security and so on and so forth. So it's not, not that easy, but you need to have specialists for that. And lastly, I think if you fully migrate, you need to have a clear migration strategy. So if you have want to make a move from, from fully on-premise to fully on cloud, I think that's definitely uh, a big initiative. But on the other hand, um, nothing stops you from starting and experimenting small and then extending that and, and um, removing all the legacy on-premise components and environments uh, step by step. So I think this is perfectly doable and I would definitely recommend uh, rather start building this this knowledge and and uh, make experiences with or, or, or gain, learn gain some learnings um, with the architecture uh, than waiting for a big bang migration I see is it hard to start a curiosity is it very hard to find the talent and to build this competency in-house I don't think in general, I mean, it also depends a little bit. There is a certain vendor lock in because the various um, uh, providers have some specificities about how their um, services are managed and are operated. But in general, you find these, these people uh, well on the market. Uh, in contrast, if you have never done this before and all the, the colleagues that you have are used to operating themselves, then this knowledge needs to be built and you need to find a way to, to bring this to your uh, to your colleagues. Um, but in general, I think the, the, the knowledge is there and, and you can find it on the market. Alex, you've worked with uh, many retailers, so maybe we can uh, look a little bit more at, in the, uh, for uh, the industry specific uh, prerequisites, if there is such a thing. Um, what, what would you say, like by working with uh, so many clients and uh, what, do you, what learnings would you, would you like to share about this? I think to the, to the talent issue, like I say, for for Jan's point, I don't think talent is the problem. I think it's more about experience and skills to be clear about, have you done what you are looking to do before? So I think one of the, the reasons that cloud technologies aren't adopted is it's not the answer to a question. It's a, it's a solution, it's an enabler, but it's not a strategy. So it's when we do see people unpacking the monolith, I think that's a great way of looking at Jan. I think what we do see is like when I when I started my career in, in kind of software kind of 15 years ago, uh, our biggest competitor was homegrown solutions that the brands were operating themselves that just didn't scale. And why we were successful is we didn't look at one or the other. We looked at, to begin with, incremental delivery. How do we have a hybrid model where we look at the services that we can help you with that will add incremental value to your business rather than focusing on how do I shift your core operations from where they are right now into the cloud, just moving from A to B, but looking at what are the things that are difficult today that make cloud technologies make sense for your business. And then looking at proving out that business case and looking at that as how you get a step change in the organization towards uh, taking that leap towards cloud-based technologies. And I think that's where vendors and, and partners can help is to basically say, but uh, at Imarsis, we've got 4,000 deployments under our belts. There is no one brand side that's ever worked at 4,000 businesses. Uh, if they have, run a mile. It's a, it's a scary person to deal with. But from a vendor side, you get to bring to the table, here's how it works for other people like you, and here's what's worked before to give that pattern of success. But then it's really about the brand having that uh, internal skill set and those people who help you better understand what it is they're looking to achieve and help you build that roadmap with those clear milestones that help eat into that big monolithic challenge of how do I move all of my operations? That's not the big thing you need to look at. You don't need to move everything. It's about what makes sense to move, what benefits the business, what benefits the customer, and how do you leverage your experience to help the brand make that step change rather than switch one off and switch one on. 
Well, it's really interesting. I mean, if we look at digital transformation, you talk to many people and they say, yeah, we absolutely transformed. We migrated to the cloud, but they didn't really do anything else. They just moved one thing to another place. I mean, yeah, this helps them, but uh, I, do you believe that this is really what digital transformation is? Sorry, it's already moving towards another topic, but out of curiosity, Alex, what do you think? Yeah, a, a transformation is a change in an operating model, not a change in a technology set. And I think that's the, the key thing is that if you're going to work the way you're working today in a different place, that's not a transformation, that's a migration. And I think the key things that people need to look at is what can you do in the cloud that you couldn't do with your existing legacy stack? And what are the pressure points and the change points organizationally that will help you get the most out of that transition? So I think it's being clear about what the business objectives are, who are the stakeholders and what you're looking to achieve is the number one priority in any cloud migration project because it has to be a transformation because the way that you work with an on-premise technology does not work with a cloud-based technology and does not enable you to get the, the, the most out of it. So it does have to have a change in mindset, a change in philosophy, even a change in DevOps and everything else that goes with it. There's culturally a shift that needs to happen with any technology purchase that is leading someone to the cloud. I think there's a lot of people who are already in the cloud in terms of their hosting, but they're not cloud native in either their infrastructure or their uh, engineering practices to be able to leverage what's, uh, what's at your disposal uh, with uh, with these different open source and cloud technologies. Got it. So one second, let's move on to the next question. We're running a little bit out of time. Um, so Jan, this is for you. What do you need to specifically watch out for in the cloud environment? I think we touched upon a few things, but um, could you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, I can start with something that might seem counterintuitive at first, but it, I think it, I hope it makes also sense. And that is costs. Um, because of course, it helps you because you're much flexible with the costs if you're going to the cloud. And uh, nevertheless, you need to be aware that being in the cloud, um, it makes it super easy for you to spin up services, servers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you need to watch out for these spendings uh, if your engineering teams can do that. Um, for example, what I mentioned earlier on, you can ramp up easily a full size uh, load test environment that replicates the live production environment. You shouldn't forget to shut that down afterwards um, in order to not overspend on your budget. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I also briefly mentioned already is the topic of security. So it's a different environment. Misconfigurations can open up attack vectors um, and you need to have the specific knowledge um, so you should also be uh, paying uh, some attention to that topic. And uh, what you can do about this is you need governance for both. And that's different from what you have on legacy stacks. Uh, and that comes back to the, to the uh, talent and to the skill sets that you need. And uh, lastly, I think there's also the, the vendor login topic, especially if you want to leverage these numerous value added service, the value added services that um, also Alex described to be cloud native, right? Making uh, use of most of the benefits that are offered. And um, then a switch to another cloud vendor will be challenging. Uh, at the same time, I don't think this is a big issue. I think you just need to be aware, but it's most probably worth it. Uh, but this also affects uh, like what, what talent you need to look for and what knowledge you need to build. Uh, but this I would say is the, see as the main points to consider. Alex, would you add anything to that? I think it's actually really good advice. I think that the billing model and how you budget for it, not just in terms of deployment, but in terms of ongoing operation, is the single biggest thing that people get wrong when making a, a, a move to the cloud, particularly when it comes to um, uh, processing st uh, solutions. Like storage isn't the problem. Like having data stored in a location is not a problem. It's about how data moves around and the billing model of, uh, of, of different cloud vendors is really important to coach your stakeholders through internally to not just say how much it's gonna cost this year, but if you hit your growth targets, how much is it gonna cost next year? So uh, we have a, a client who is in the mobile app space. They have more than 200 million mobile app downloads but you're not gonna keep all of those people active all of the time. The app business is a very, very changeable business, which means that the veracity of the data is very, very, very choppy. 
how long do they need to store data? Three years, four years, five years? What's the chance of someone coming back? And if you're storing every single event and also processing every single event in your analytics on a daily or a weekly basis, then that's a very, very costly exercise. So having a strategy about what you're storing, what you're using, what you're operating and aligning your stakeholders to the billing model is really, really important with cloud deployment so that people know what are the value metrics that are used for the pricing and how do those value metrics equate to how your business is, is looking for a business outcome. So if the pricing metric of your cloud vendor is on kind of contacts or events or whatever else is going to happen, you need to coach your internal stakeholders who are used to very black and white CapEx, OpEx conversations into something that's a little bit more of a moving target to say, this is a growth uh, uh, vector and this is something that we need to look at. And that is something that people need to do is to coach the finance teams through billing and contract periods and make sure that you don't just bill on annual cycles, but you're working with your development, your engineering teams to understand your utilization and that you're planning to make sure that you've got the right economies of scale building your contracts as you move forward. You got it. When uh, um, we talked about, I think, Jan, you mentioned it, that online and offline become closely, uh, closely integrated. And uh, um, when you said that, I was thinking about this question. Uh, I mean, I don't think you can do this without uh, looking at data. And also, if you want to offer like a lot of personalized uh, uh, offers to your customers or just understand what's going on uh, with the customer at each uh, interaction point, I think uh, data is, is uh, basically fundamental. So uh, do you think we're at the moment where data is still a challenge or do you think companies started to know how to handle it and were in a good position? What have you experienced mm. so far? Mm. Yeah, first of all, let me take, of course, I will naturally take a, a perspective rather from, from the fashion context here. And here I would say, most importantly, data is an opportunity, especially in fashion e-commerce. But nevertheless, you're right. Of course, it comes with challenges. If we think about customer data, like, I don't know, body measurements or site preferences or skin type, that are very important to create uh, fashion e-commerce experiences that are uh, very enjoyable for customers. Um, they require a high degree of trust from customers, right? In other online contexts, if we look at the music industry, people are eager to share their data, for example, in form of playlists and connect with others and so on. Um, but this is different uh, in, in the fashion context as this is viewed as very personal information, which is, of course, is, right? And uh, in order to, to work with data, um, you need to build trust with your customers in a way that they understand what you use the data for, uh, in the way that they are sure that their data is stored safely, and also that they ultimately feel and know that they have the control over their data. So this is the customer data. If you have that, there's also the other side of the coin, and that is kind of the data from manufacturers or from the supplier side. So talking about, for example, 3D scans of garments or shoes, that can be used to derive measurements that are important to determining how an individual item will fit a customer or 3D uh, CAD files uh, from the production process that will uh, also um, yeah, indicate wh where does the item fit how or video data simply visualizing elasticity and flexibility of, of materials. All this data could be there and it would be very beneficial but it's not yet common practice so I think uh, we as an industry have to get together and align on common standards uh, to make exchange of this data more easy and, um, and more standard. And if we have that, we can in the end provide benefits to all of the customers. Namely, we could enable a lot of experiences through this data, both from customers as well as from, from uh, suppliers, like um, presenting a tailored assortment to you as a customer relevant to your style, to your sizes, to your existing wardrobe. Or you could offer something um, like a virtual dressing room and avatar that represents the customer's body and allows uh, the customer to experience the fashion items on their body, um, the size and fit, uh, how it would look like in combinations with other parts making an outfit and, and so on and so forth. Um, what we could also do with that data is making your wardrobe more easy, handle, um, um, and manageable. Like if you know the data about previous purchases, we can 
um, create overviews for customers in, in their wardrobe and support them in managing it. We can recommend matching new pieces to them. Um, we can help them getting rid of items that they have bought and uh, left but no longer want. And they can sell this uh, back as pre-owned fashion to other customers. And um, on top of all of these benefits, I think uh, and this ex superior experience that can be powered by data, I think this, this smarter way of online shopping could empower customers to enjoy fashion also more sustainably by reducing returns and driving this circularity in fashion. So I think data in general is a huge opportunity, but it comes with challenge. Um, yeah. um, Alex, uh, we're ha we have uh, eight minutes left, so I would still like to hear your point of view on this, and then we're still going to talk about how to break down data silos with event streaming. So. What what uh, what's your point in in uh, in this? I think it's a tough act to follow with Jan's commentary there, but I think the the, the key thing for me is uh, I think Jeff Bezos said it pretty well. Data is a competitive advantage. So it's like the data that you have in your business is a competitive advantage. What you know about your customers is unique to your brand. How you use that data is the challenge. So I think data strategy is a huge challenge, and data maturity is a huge challenge. There are many businesses that aren't used to using data in their decision-making, whether that's in how they build products, how they manufacture products, how they distribute products, how they sell products, how they present products. Like there's a huge opportunity in retail for data to enable better decisions around how do I offer a more personalized and individualized experience to the end consumer and be a little bit more digitally savvy, which will enable you to be a lot more efficient in doing that. Uh, and I think that's the, the opportunity is, is there. The challenge is getting people on board to be able to actually utilize that data, which I think is a, the, the right opportunity to move into the to next question, which is data isn't the challenge, the silos are the challenge. And um, the the buzzwords around the, the monikers and the, the different cool things in the industry, for which I, I readily admit I'm guilty of, uh, event streaming is not a topic that people should be talking about outside very, very, very specialist technology areas. It's not a strategy. I think it's more about looking at the, the world has changed to be a little bit more real time in terms of how data is generated and how data is used. I think what businesses should be looking at is how do I better use my data to provide a better experience for the customer and a more predictable, profitable outcome for the business? Those are the questions people should be looking for and seeing how data can be used uh, more effectively to do that and how cloud technologies and open source technologies can better enable them to use that unique competitive advantage they have, their customer product and business data to be able to execute and act upon that opportunity which is presented. Um, Jan, would you like to uh, get back to a response for what Alex just said regarding event streaming? Yeah, I think uh, I can emphasize what he said. I would like to add just one aspect, and that is the topic that he, he mentioned uh, before. Like the, the, the question is not what data do you have, but what do you make out of the data? And also the event streaming uh, is something that we use in, in Zalando widely. Also you need it if you have the microservice architecture and so on. You don't need it, but it, it makes things a lot easier and enables this near time, near real time processing. But what it also enables on our end is um, bringing this data that flows around on the operational systems into a central data lake that then also allows these business and uh, business insights that are driven by data um, and that are very vital to making business decisions and product decisions and so on. I, I want to change my answer at the last moment because I just remember the client conversation last week, which is if, if it takes you a week to generate a report or if it takes you three days to generate insights, yes, event streaming is the way to go because it'll start yeah. a conversation around how you're more agile in, uh, in, in the way that you utilize technology and, and how you operate. I think uh, how, how do you move quicker and how do you move faster and how does data move around your organization quicker, faster, and better is the conversation. Uh, and, and if event streaming is the, the way to unlock that conversation, as it seems to be with some trendy circles right now, then I'm all for it. Exactly. Uh, what can you do with event streaming, uh, Jan? It's, I mean, let's just look at the uh, retail and e-commerce. Uh, does it help you with real-time inventory? Does it, I don't know, maybe you can optimize delivery in time or uh, 
in real time, sorry, uh, what are the key things? Why would you use this? Yeah, I, I think this, uh, as it enables asynchronous decoupling of, of services, uh, which allows this individual scaling that we talked about earlier on of microservices, and it allows the near real-time or real-time processing. So for example, to be specific in Zalando, uh, one of my department uses that to create offers out of product data that changes very rarely, um, price data that changes more often, and stock data, which changes very frequently because with every purchase, the stock levels uh, change, right? And make these uh, three types of data, one type of data, which is a product offer that we then show to our customers. And this works very well because all these changes that I mentioned, they, they, they are streamed into the platform that then combines them to product offers and streams them further to front end premises. And um, yeah, for that we use uh, Nakali, that's an open source extension that we also publicly shared of Kafka, a streaming uh, uh, service. Um, so this allows us to really update prices and stock levels and product data and make them readily available for customers, which would be much more challenging uh, from a technical perspective if we didn't go for event streaming. All right, so guys, that's that's a wrap. Thank you, and thank you, Alex, for being uh, being here with us. Uh, the next event will be running on the 16th of June uh, with uh, the BBC and Financial Times. So uh, if you want to join us, then uh, check my check us out. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, have a nice have a nice day. Bye bye. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. bye.